All right, I just shared that link on Facebook. So people should be joining us in a minute. All right, you got audio, you sound good. Awesome. So whenever you're ready, take All right. it away. All right. Um. All right, hello everybody. Um, my name is John Hamilton. I am an instructor and professional potter in Arvada, Colorado. I work at the Arvada Center, which is a wonderful facility for all things art. Um, well, today we're gonna be doing some, um, I'm gonna do a sake set. And so I've got my decanter here and some two ounce cups. Uh, my decanter is a larger one made for uh, group settings opposed to individual sizes. Uh, it holds roughly 18, 20 ounce, ounces of uh, sake. And we're just gonna go through the process of making the decanter and then throwing the two ounce cups off the hump. I'll talk about um, several different techniques that I use. Uh, we'll do kind of beginning type techniques. And then we'll also work a little bit with some more advanced things. So ask as many questions as you need to. Uh, I have my friend on the line, Sarah Cole. I think I said that right. And she's gonna be uh, asking those questions because I'm not looking at them currently and then I'll answer them accordingly. So please ask any and every question that you feel is gonna be beneficial to you kind of learning what's going on um, and we'll uh, get started. So we're gonna start by working with the cups um, and I, as I said I'm going to be throwing clay off of the hump for this process and so what that means is I'm going to take a large amount of clay um, I'm going to focus on uh, just working on the top portion of this so you're going to see a lot of wobbly things going on on the bottom of the bat and um, on the bottom of the mound and then I'm just going to be working with small portions off of the top. So before I actually get the, the clay spinning on the wheel, I need to work it. And what I'm gonna be doing is wedging the clay and Aligning the particles in the clay. So they kind of start to do what I want. I'm evening the moisture out from the center to the outside. Any dry spots, rehydrating. 
And then if I have any air bubbles in my mound of clay, I'm kind of getting rid of some of those. So this is kind of like kneading dough. Uh, the purpose of kneading dough is that we are adding air into. So these are smaller movements compared to kneading dough. And I'm kind of folding the clay back into it itself. In order for ceramics to work growing on the potter's wheel, uh, I need that clay to glide through my hands. So a little bit of water, uh, I'm not oversaturating the clay. Oversaturating the clay is, um, it's just going to cause the clay to get super wet and it's not gonna wanna stand up over its, on its own strength. I'm just gonna try and apply even pressure to the side and the top of this mound. I don't work the clay. This is another way to actually wedge the clay. So I'm squeezing the clay up into a cone and I'm gonna press it down. I'm gonna do this a few times. Anytime I throw off the pump, I need to work the clay like this a few times and it helps prevent some cracking that can occur. So you can probably see that this is kind of out around down here. I'm really not focused on that. I just needed to attach the clay to the wheel head and I'm focused more so on this top portion. So when I start measuring out my cups, uh, I need to go to a familiar feel and I'm grabbing the clay in a way it's allowing me to uh, know exactly how much clay I'm going to need with making these little cups. And so I just need to throw enough to kind of see how that feels. So typically when I make a set, if I'm going to have two or three cups for uh, one of my decanters, um, I want to first make sure that as many cups as I have for that set is going to allow uh, the, um, the decanter is going to be able to fill up um, obviously the first set serving, but um, I'm also thinking of obviously refilling those cups. So um, I want to kind of think about how many ounces my decanter is going to hold, and then I'm going to determine how many cups is going to go with this, how many people are going to be drinking uh, with this piece. Is it a single serving or is it going to be multiple servings? And then from there, I'm going to make multiple cups um, using my fingers and measuring tools. You can pull out a pair of calipers, which is going to determine and help you figure out this, the uh, diameter of your piece. Um, I'll use rulers sometimes, but a lot of times I just like to use my hands. I've got a nice little ball. And I'm just gonna slowly start by diving into the center. I want my fingers to naturally find the center. I'm gonna tilt my camera in front of me because I know that that's probably taking a lot of it. Hopefully that doesn't fall over in the water. I'm being aware of how deep uh, my finger goes in at this point. Uh, this little mark that I've made down here, uh, what that's signifying is where I'm going to cut the clay off. And so I don't want to manipulate this too much and get rid of that. But I'm also focused on where the interior is setting. So all my, decant my little cups, um, I have a nice inset foot. So I want to make sure that I'm leaving enough clay at the bottom for that. And then I'm also thinking of how deep this well is going to be in this clay on the side is going to interpret or transform into that. So once I have established where that bottom is going to be, I'm just going to use the tip of my finger and I'm just going to move the clay over. Just establish the foot, the interior of that.
I'm going fairly visual right now, getting an idea of how wide I want this interior to be. And I have to make it larger than what it's going to be finished. Clay shrinks. Uh, my clay in particular shrinks uh, just around 12%. And that's from the time that we start working with it on the wheel to the time that we get it out of that final firing. I'm going to try and keep as much water out of the bottom of this as possible. And the reason being is the more water that sits inside of this, it softens the clay. And then during the drying process, it uh, the bottom is more saturated than the walls are going to be. The walls are going to dry faster and it's going to cause an uneven drying and possibly have the uh, bottom crack. So I'm going to keep pulling water out of that as much as possible. And then I'm going to uh, continually do what's called compressing. And that's just applying this light amount of pressure. And I pull from the outside in, kind of getting those particles to align kind of interiorly, uh, allowing the spiral of this to go toward the center opposed to when I pull the clay out, the spiral goes to the outside. After I've done that, I'm gonna jump my hands over to the opposite side. And I'm just gonna apply a small amount of pressure, evening out with both of my fingers. Go to the bottom of the piece, apply pressure, even out. And as I do that, I'm just slowly lifting the clay up. I'm still, once again, trying not to really mess with this little line that I've created. Uh, if I cut too high, I'm going to end up losing the bottom of my piece. And right now, I'm just using the tips of my fingers. Stopping at the top every so often to compress the top. Cleaning that water out. And when I measure the depth of this, uh, after, because I've done this so many times, what I'm focusing on is where the interior of my finger lines up. And then this diameter here is very important. So uh, I wanna make sure that I'm mimicking that as much as possible every time I make a piece um, that's supposed to be the set, uh, part of a set. So this particularly, I want the clay to almost touch the crease of my knuckle. I'm going to do one more little pull. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to smooth the outside of it now. I like to use the clay as a kind of a canvas. And so what that the smoothing it's allowing me to do is when I stain the surface of the pieces, and I'll grab one of these real quick. When I stain the surface of the piece, I want most of the stain to kind of go, I don't know which one we're talking to, <laughs> to kind of go more in the lines here, but I want to show the marks of the kind of the tools that I'm using. And it just distresses the surface. If I were to leave all of these lines in here, it's going to take away from the surface design. And I really want to showcase more so the lines than the surface, the, the, uh, the lines that are being created by throwing. So I'm using the curved end of this metal rib. And I'm just going to use my finger on the interior and kind of trace the surface of this. And I'm going to be scraping off slip. And that just gets the surface nice and smooth. I use the natural curve of the rib that I, I purchased to grab that curve. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask away. All right, so now that I've made my cup, uh, I need to get it off of the wheel. So I'm gonna use just a needle tool. And I'm gonna carve underneath this a little bit further with the tip of my finger. And I really wanna establish this foot and of how deep it's gonna be. 
And the reason I do that is these feet sit inside of the base of the stand here. And so I've got this, uh, this is a black acrylic that I just cut on a scroll saw. Um, and then I use the foot to fit inside of here so it doesn't slide around and fall right off. If it were on the surface, it's a little too glossy and it'll cause the foot will just slide right off. So this allows me to feel comfortable when uh, the cat jumps up on the counter and this is being displayed, that the cat's not just gonna knock that off of there. or the kids or whoever is clumsy. So I'm gonna just hold the outside, just be ready to catch this. And the idea is to go underneath and I wanna go about the radius uh, in depth. And as soon as I feel it loosen up, I'm just gonna slowly and carefully pinch around the base of this. If I pinch too high, uh, I've got less clay thickness here. So the thickness at the base is gonna allow me to squeeze this without deforming the shape and it's gonna allow me to hold shape so this doesn't oval out too much during the firing process. Oh, as I bump it. Clay does have a bit of a molecular memory. And so when I bump it, if I just use my finger and lightly push that back into place, what's gonna happen is during the firing, it's gonna wanna move back uh, to that place where it was distorted. So I wanna make sure that I allow uh, the clay to remember the shape that it was trying to hold on to. All right, now we're gonna cut it off the top. Make sure my hands are wet. I'm just bracing this needle tool up against the side of my thumb, just the tip, creating an incision and slowly waiting for that to hop right off of there. And I'll carry that and set it off to the side. So I'll do a couple more of those, more real-time speed. Focusing on the top, not so much the base of this. Applying pressure, honing. Back down. While I'm working on this next one, I'm looking at the cup that I've just made and I don't like the shape of it necessarily. Um, it tapers in a little too much at the top. I'm trying to get this nice even flare from top the, the rim here. I want this diameter to match the bottom diameter of where that curve ends and begins. So I'm analyzing the piece, what I like and don't like about it. And that's some of that I can clean up later. I might be able to save that piece. Um, but I'm going to act as if I can't, and I'm going to throw until I have multiple cups that I could then look at and say, okay, I'm going to choose three of these, these three, and that's going to allow me to have my set. For you potters out there, um, if you're struggling with throwing cylinders and everything starts to flare out and become more of a bowl shape. Push the clay toward the center as you're raising that wall. Kind of create an imaginary isosceles triangle and pull your hands toward the point of that, that triangle. So I grabbed a little bit too much clay on this one to start. I'm a little deeper than I like to be. 
Um, I can cut that off a little bit later. I can cut it off now. But I, so what I did was I started at the top, applied light pressure. And as I started pushing my fingers down the side, I applied a little bit more pressure with my outside finger, trying to keep my interior finger as vertical as possible. And pushing that clay, you probably saw this little ring that I can cut off this kind of was bothering me in thickness. And so I cut that off and rode that down the side of this cup. Really focusing on uniformity. Um, I, I don't want this any of my pieces to feel too heavy where they shouldn't. So I'm making sure that the wall thickness feels right. I'm making sure that it visually is uniform. Uh, and so that's what I was looking at with this other piece over here. I feel it flares out a little too much at the bottom. And so I'm trying to try and take that away. I also bevel the rims of all of my cups. Um, and it's just to make the piece look thinner than it actually is. As a functional potter, I want my my work to be durable. And if I get too thin and too lightweight, it's not gonna feel functional. So I want when the person picks it up to have a little bit of weight behind it, uh, but then it's durable for things like washing, whether you hand wash or throw them in the dishwasher. Um, it's got some kind of thermal resistance qualities. It's gonna trap some of the heat in a little bit better if you're drinking out of a mug for some tea or coffee. And then, uh, but having that bevel on the top, it allows the clay to act as a funnel and pushes the liquid towards your mouth. Let me give it some direction. All right, so I like that one better. And I'll kind of tricky this real quick and show you guys why. So I'm gonna tilt it up, tilt show you this one it flares out a little too much here i'm probably going to clean that up and trim that up later and make that diameter work a little bit better um, i could have flared this out more but i feel that that would have made this rim way too large so instead i've got a little thickness if i look inside this i can tell that i've got a little thickness that i can work with so i'll shape that a little bit later when it's a little bit drier this one's closer to what i like uh, there's a little bit more of a flare um, but it's more uniform top to bottom. Well, you guys, I knew that was going to happen. And I'll just do one more and then we'll move on to working on the decanter. So I've got some pieces over to my left. Probably looks like my right. I don't know. This is the first. I'm not sure how it's reading up for you guys, but I'll talk about some of those pieces a little bit later. And the aesthetic that I'm going for.
Um, another way that I can raise the wall is if I kind of hug this little mound that I'm working on, and I'm just going to squeeze with me. my thumbs are going to stay as close together as possible. I'm going to pull my fingers, whichever is comfortable, into the tips of my thumb. So I'm just going to grab that clay on the outside. And as I start to feel it push into my fingers, I'm just going to slowly put that off. I can do this same idea right in front of me. Uh, it's all about how comfortable you are. I tell my students all the time that there's no wrong way to throw. Uh, there's just the basics that you have to grasp onto. And then you use that, uh, and the knowledge that you get from teaching the other teachers, um, you know, whether you're watching YouTube videos and you compile all of that, you kind of get rid of what you don't like about a certain way of working with the clay and you personalize everything. You find ways to make it relevant to you and comfortable. If we're not comfortable, then we're gonna have issues with um, moving the clay the way that it needs to move. So if I notice that my student is doing something that I totally would never do, but they're making a pie, I prefer to let them work the way that they're working. I don't wanna hinder their creative space. And so if it works, keep doing it. Do it until it doesn't work. Not too bad. I think the second and third ones work for me. So later on, those will firm up a little bit and I will do what's called trimming. I'll take some tools and we call these loop tools and I will go around and just basically scrape what I don't want off of the pot. And so the clay is at that point what we refer to as a leather hard. It feels um, like cheddar cheese or um, kind of soft stage of like chocolate. And uh, what that does is it cuts into that and just removes these ribbons of clay. And so I'll be able to clean up, uh, create the interior inset foot, make this edge nice and sharp like I like to, and then remove any weight off of the piece that I'm not happy with. So John, someone has a question. Yes. And they wanna know if what you listen to while you're creating, if you've got a throwing pottery playlist. Um, not necessarily, I listen to whatever's on. Um, I, I've got one of those, uh, I'm gonna say um, the Amazon, Alex with an A at the end, because I don't want it to turn on right now. And so that's nice. Uh, it was a gift because my wife noticed that when I got up to turn on my radio, that my hands were like completely full of clay and I didn't care. And so my radio was covered in clay dirt and all that. So um, it depends on the feeling, I guess, for the day. If it's 
kind of, I'm sitting right in front of a window right now, which uh, I love being outside. And so I can open that window. And if it's uh, just rainy out, I want something that's gonna be uplifting. I love being in the rain, um, but I don't like how dreary it looks. So anything upbeat and fun. Uh, sometimes I'll prop up an iPad in front of me and kind of just need noise in the background. Um, and it's rare that I don't have anything going. Um, I've got some chairs set up in here for my daughters and my wife to come in and hang out if they wanted to talk and hang out with me for the day. But I just whatever's on, it's, um, I don't know. I don't, I kind of did that let's see how different music affects the way that I work. And I don't felt feel that it actually hindered or helped in one way or another. I just like noise and background noise. So um, podcasts sometimes. Um, my wife actually one day asked me if I ever quit. I was watching a video inside and I probably just came in from being in the studio. And it was of course a pottery video, but I'll be working on clay in here and listening to like a pottery podcast. I don't quit. This is just, I'm obsessed. Um, I'm a big hip hop fan. So a lot of times if I want to listen to music, I'll turn on hip hop, reggae, um, That's pretty much a music choice, reggae, hip hop, soul funk. All right, so these particular decanters, um, Takari's I think is how you pronounce it. I'm probably gonna slaughter it. Um, and they call it Takari because they're used for uh, both hot or cold sake. And it's this kind of curve that happens at the top you'll see several different types of uh, containers for drinking sake um, the narrow neck allows when you're heating your sake it prevent prevents the heat from escaping some of the when you're using a, a cold sake container uh, it's more open it's a lot of them are like these bowl shaped with a spout on the end. Um, and you'll see some of those that even taper in and those are more likely for uh, warm liquids from what I understand. Um, so these are specifically, I, I weigh and measure out all of my clay. These are specifically a pound and a half. And I came on that because I like to make my drinking tumblers um, to hold over 16 ounces. I wanted to make sure that I could refer to this as a pint glass. And so I wanted to get the height. I wanted to get the width with the, just the volume content. And so I took my, I, that's what I make my tumblers out as well, is a pound and a half. Uh, and it allows me to get around 18 ounces of liquid. And so because I wanted these more for like a uh, party setting or multiple people sitting down to have a drink, um, I wanted to think about the volume content and how I actually like to sit and talk with people and have a drink. And so when I decided that I could get that roughly 18 to 20 ounces out of my tumbler, I felt that that was a good size. And then I'll take the height of that and drop that in to this neck. And so that was really the thought process for actually creating the size and the shape. Um, I wanted something simple. A lot of the shapes that I make are very simple because it's more surface than it is about the um, kind of the complexity of the form. And um, I really just wanted to showcase more so the design element on the surface opposed to the uh, kind of crazy cool shape. And another thing too is how functional is the piece for me? Um, these are just real simple cylinders all neck in as I was talking about. And I'm, like I said, I'm really focused on how simplistic the shape is to use and utilize. Uh, cleaning, um, how does it pour out of the form? I tried some more kind of heavier shoulder complex forms and I felt that the liquid kind of jumped and burped out and I wanna stay away from uh, kind of that lack of functionality. So I've got some one pound clay balls weighed out. And I'm gonna do that wedging. So 
So I'll pre-measure clay for the day. And a lot of times if I'm sitting down to throw like these sake cups um, or sake sets, I'll have, you know, my mound of clay and I'll throw cups on there until that mound is no more. And then I'll have, I'll kind of tally up how many cups I've, I've got and that'll determine how many um, sake decanters I make. So wedging the clay is about efficiency, um, not necessarily how many times. I just got into this rhythm of wedging roughly 50 to 75 times when I wedge my ball of clay. And it's about, like I said, the efficiency of moving, removing air and dry uh, surface and kind of redistributing that moisture. So uh, when you're wedging, just work at it until you feel kind of comfortable with how, how consistent the clay is from interior to exterior. A lot of my teaching practices discuss consistency, um, how comfortable you are. And so you have to recreate the feeling of what you're doing in order to be more successful, I guess, in a sense. All right, let me see. I've got something propped up. I think you guys might wanna see that from that view. A lot of times when working with my ball of clay on the wheel, I try not to look directly at the clay. Um, I want to feel the clay. Our eyes kind of deceive us sometimes. And so when I'm working, I just want to know that what I'm feeling is right. So I'll look away from the clay and I'll stare off into the yard, close my eyes sometimes if I'm not focusing enough on it. So I'm just going to go through this one kind of real time. And then I'll do one more and talk about some basic steps. I had to work out a lot of, uh, kind of, I guess I always get jittery when I start working on the potters wheel and do live streams. So I was working out the nerves. I was working out, I drank more coffee than I normally do. It's just tasting really good this morning. So super jittery. And I flopped like six or seven pots in a row. And I was like, I'm not gonna be able to make anything today. And so my practice typically comes with whatever I feel like making for the day. It's, I try not to rely too much on what I have to make to, to kind of refill my stock. Um, typically it's cups that come down to that. A lot of my other forms tend to be whatever sounds good or looks good when I sit down. But I always do have a plan, even though I'm not being as, I'm uh, being you know, less selective, I guess. I feel that having a plan when you sit down to work at the wheel um, prevents the issue with, well, I was making a vase, but it turned into a bowl. I think everything just turns into a bowl because we don't have a plan. So like I said, I'm just gonna make this one kind of real time Work out one last jitter <laughs> and then uh, we'll do one more and then I'll show some pieces, see if there's any questions and we'll call it a day. I think I like this shape, it has this, um, like old style milk jug feel to it. Uh, and I don't know why I'm so drawn to it, but I feel that with the way that I like to work that I like to create, it just 
looks and feels nice for the simplicity of it. Definitely not putting milk in it though. And misplaced the tool. I'll turn up five seconds right in front of my face. All right, so I normally wait to do the next portion uh, because we're on video and I'll go into detail on this, um, but um, when I make my spouts, it's not about pulling the clay out and away from the piece. It's about kind of pushing and pulling the clay kind of together. So I'm gonna kind of squeeze. and then caress the lip of this out. One of the instructors at the Arvada Center, Lynn Hull, calls it the pouty lip. You want this lip to kind of kind of go under. And that helps uh, prevent the, the liquid from dribbling over the end and running down the side as much. I just started hearing this echo. I think you guys have been hearing this this whole time. And then I'm just gonna lightly, kind of any burrs that might bother me, I'll clean it up more later. And then nice little wet thumb. And deform this side, that just gives a nice place to hold it. And in the bottoms of my pieces, I'll get this little wiggle wire cut to them. Well, not all of them, but um, that one's pretty straightforward too. Um, majority of them get this wiggle wire effect and it's mostly, uh, all it is is a spring basically that's been stretched extremely and it creates this nice little wave. I was uh, taking a workshop with a potter and he critiqued my work. And at the time I was just putting it on everything and nothing, uh, the work wasn't anything like I'm doing currently. And he, uh, he asked me why I was doing it. And he's like, don't stop it. Just why are you doing it? And so I had to think about that. He really made me kind of give it a full purpose and when I started working toward this kind of space theme, um, I think I found the purpose for it. And it was, I wanted it to feel that these pieces had some form of a thruster on the bottom of them. And so my cups, I stopped doing them to my cups, uh, plates. Um, majority of my work at that time and just focused on why I was using it. And it kind of had a purpose after that. Hey, John. Yes. Uh, it looks like the video on your iPhone. Just oh, I think off. somebody, just, somebody just tried calling me, I think. <laughs> um, there is also Are a question. Good? Yeah, yeah yes. so you're back. Um, so someone asked, spinning wheels makes them jittery. Is there a way to do this sort of art without spinning? Very oh, is it? Um, I'm assuming it's probably because, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the wheel can be intimidating. Um, Yes, there's a way to do, there's a way to do everything. My, 
my biggest thing that I want my students to know is that everything that you want to do on the, uh, in clay is possible. It's just a matter of how are we going to get there. And um, one thing you can do is um, if you take a cardboard tube and you wrap a thin piece of plastic around it, that'll get your cylinder formed. Um, whatever you want to achieve, we just have to find kind of the steps it takes to get to that point. And uh, the wheel is just a tool, the, the, just as much as that cardboard tube is a tool. So find a way to kind of an aesthetic that you want to achieve, and then we need to figure out how to get to that point. Um, so if you can, if you've gone through and you like to hand build and you can't, you've done the process of wrapping the, uh, the clay around a tube and then removing that tube later, uh, this is really no different than that. Um, like I said, it's just a different tool that I'm using opposed to that, uh, that, that little cardboard tube. That I answer, hopefully I answered that correctly. Um, Wheel, the wheel can be intimidating. Um, some people prefer hand building over. I'm gonna, that's what I was trying to do. I'm gonna change my towel out and soaked. Give me a quick second. So some people prefer just hand building to working at the wheel. And it can be physically taxing. The idea of working at the potter's wheel is it should be, it should feel effortless for the most part. Um, if you're struggling and fighting yourself and practically sweating, um, I would say that's probably the only time you're actually doing something physically wrong. It should be more of a comfortable, relaxed way of working. And we're using our body opposed to you know the muscles in our arms to actually form the clay. Um, the larger amounts of clay you get, obviously you're gonna feel like you have to use more physical strength opposed to just leaning into the clay. And so I talk about the recreating the feeling of working on the wheel and how that's supposed to help me replicate the pieces that I'm trying to work with. So my, I have my stool always in the same position when I'm ready to throw. Um, something as simple as kind of when I tuck my elbow, where does that elbow tuck every time? Um, when I uh, dip my hand in water and grab a certain amount of, of water to put on the piece, how am I applying that water? So when I work on this piece now, I'll talk about those as I go. So one of the things is just like my wedging. I'm wedging roughly around... 50 to 75 times, and I'm waiting for that clay to feel the way that it's supposed to. Um, sometimes you get a bag of clay and that clay is sopping wet or too hard. You have to get that clay back to a consistency that you like. The great thing about hand building is I can roll out a slab and if it's too wet, just kind of let it sit. But that's what I'm doing with the clay is I'm allowing it to either get as wet as I like to use it or as firm as I like to use it before I actually start working with it. So recreating process is really important to actually making the piece. All right, so my elbow locking it nice and firmly against my thigh. Not all the way into my gut, but right there on my thigh, where my body and my hip meet, my hip and my leg, I should say. Um, I'm allowing my body to tense up if my shoulder is just enough that I'm leaving my left hand nice and sturdy, and I'm pushing down and in at the same time. Um, applying equal pressure, I'm just waiting for that clay to respond. When I'm easing off of the clay, uh, relaxing my shoulders, letting myself kind of melt away from the pot. And every time you're gonna see, I'm gonna reset my hands if I need to go back into that centering mode, I'm gonna reset my elbow.
And then is that dome how I like it right before I like to start digging into the center? Um, I'm moving my fingers. Uh, they work better in pairs than individually. That's just more of a support system, making sure my hands are touching in one way or another the entire time. And then where do I set my fingers against my, my thumb before I start pivoting my fingers inward? I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So these are all things that I, I do naturally as I continually make these pots. Um, but talking through them, it kind of makes me realize things that I don't think about and I haven't thought about for quite some time now. And then uh, if you're new to throwing pots, uh, weigh everything out. Um, that way you know what you can do with that certain amount of clay. And then also check your depth for everything. So I'm gonna take my needle tool. I'm gonna stick my tool into my clay. I'm gonna grab the tool and put my fingertip to the interior base. And I'm just gonna check my depth. That's gonna allow me to translate. If I get this quarter of an inch every time I drill my finger in, I start to remember with my hands what that's supposed to feel like. And so when I look into the pot, I can kind of get an idea of how deep it is in comparison to my bat. Um, mend that hole, just apply pressure and push toward the interior. Do that a few times until you've kind of lost. Can't really see that anymore. You don't want to push down too firmly because then you completely compromise that depth that you just worked on. And then I'm just taking, once again, working with my fingers in pairs, I'm pushing from the center. My middle finger is always going to start at the center, very center of the clay, and it's going to drift toward the outside. Try not to push down. It's going to drift, and if anything, it's going to slightly move up. So across the bottom of the clay, it's going to slightly move up, causing the interior of my cup to kind of have this feel, where the wall is going to start here, and it kind of curves and dances down to the very base of this piece. Uh, this is good for cleaning. If I'm too much of a right angle, then I'm going to trap things in that corner. So having a nice curve on the interior of that piece is going to help it rinse out and clean out a lot easier. I like to open my pieces bigger than they actually need to be. And I'm actually going to go a little bit deeper for demo purposes. Um, So I like to open my pieces wider than I'm actually going to use them. And I'm gonna refer another potter at the Arvada Center, Stephen Wood. From what students tell me, he say you've got to, when you start to lift your wall, you gotta put a little bit of your bottom into your wall. And the idea behind that, from what I can understand, is that we're bringing the clay and transitioning where the foot is to where it then transitions properly into the sidewall. And that helps prevent things from cracking sometimes. Tell me if I'm wrong, Steven, I'll ask you one day when we get back to, back to business. And then I talked a little bit about this with the, the, my little cups. Um, I apply pressure from the outside and work in. So outside, apply a little bit of pressure and push in and just stop and center as close as I can. And like I said, molecular memory, I'm pushing those molecules, those uh, platelets in the clay back toward the center of the wheel. And it's allowing when this piece shrinks in, it's not being combated by the spiral going outward. It's going toward the center. I guess one other thing that I like to do, um, I've been doing this in my cups a lot. I'll do it in the bottom of this decanter. Once you've compressed and worked the interior the way that you need to to prevent it from cracking, um, I'm gonna do a little swirl in this guy. So I'm just gonna put my finger kind of at an angle. I want kind of the, the sharper point part of my the fingertip to dig into the clay. And I'm gonna trace a line, if I see this as a clock, toward my three o'clock. And that's going to allow me to have this nice spiral that unwinds. So digging in, and a nice little line out so you can kind of see what's better when it's spinning. Kind of hey, see that. Yes. Here's a question from BB. Yes. She wants to know, when you open, do you always go to the outside and back towards the center? And are you leveling the bottom that way? Um, so 
when I'm establishing leveling my the base of my piece, I'm applying pressure completely straight in. That's my open. And then I'm starting from the interior and applying pressure to the exterior. And like I said, I'm slowly lifting my hand. Where I go back in is that whole combating the, cl the clay platelets. Um, because the molecular memory, I need to make sure, and this is something that as I was working with clay and starting to find that I kept getting these cracks, one, I was allowing my water to stay in the bottom of the pot too long. But um, I also found that I was having cracking every so often and thinking about the way that clay shrinks and when it's sitting, especially I work on a plastic bat, um, there's no absorption underneath it. So whatever is underneath on these plastic bats is gonna stay a lot wetter than the exterior of this piece. So now applying pressure from the outside after I've established the interior uh, diameter of my base, then I push toward the center. I think I answered that right. Um, so I'm taking opening from obviously and pulling outward. And my kind of method is if I pull seven times from center out to make sure that this base is established and I have this nice soft curve, then I want to apply that many pushes back from out to in. And I always add one. I think that's just a luck thing. I don't know. <laughs> I hope I answered you, BB. Um, so now I'm switching my left hand from the outside to the inside. And it's all about how comfortable you are when you grab the clay. Um, I'm taking my non-dominant hand and I'm, the key is really to get your hand to invert from being on the side, the palm facing toward the other hand to my palm facing down toward the wheel head. The reason is I use my hand as a claw and I'm gonna use my right hand to back that up. I'm gonna push my sponge because I like to throw with the sponge and I'm gonna push my sponge underneath and create a nice little ridge here. You can kind of see one a little bit. Um, that's the clay that I have to grab in order to pull and create a wall. If I don't grab that clay and let the wheel spin and the clay spin between my fingers multiple times to really set that uh that depth that i've created and i just apply my hands and lift that's typically when we get this wave at the top of pieces or this thick thin in the wall and so uh, we want to make sure that we're allowing the clay to catch up with the movements that we're making so one of my things is uh applying the right amount of pressure and working slower than the wheel is moving so once again, I'm inverting, palm is facing the wheel head. I'm grabbing like a claw and we can grab the clay, squeeze and lift in one motion. Um, I have my hand here as a support system to stay, help myself stabilize as I'm working. I'm taking my sponge or some water in there. Um, it's not drenched to where it's dripping on its own, but that's gonna allow me to apply a little bit of water as I start to move my fingers up the sidewall and distribute some water and moisture. So I've slowed my wheel down a little bit and I'm pulling that clay like I was talking earlier up and in. And so this is to establish my first pull. Typically your first pull is you're really kind of a brute, brute of it all. You want to grab that clay while it's thick and you can really manhandle it um, and push the clay in and really pull up. So a lot of times you want to get the majority of your height out of that first pull. And the second pull is where I do what Stephen Wood says and I put a little bit of bottom into my wall. So I'm going to push underneath. There's that depth that I was talking about. I'm grabbing you can see that kind of nice shadow that's starting to take form underneath there. And then I'm kind of turning the tip of my finger a little bit. Let's pull some play off. A little bit as I'm starting to move up the sidewall. So I'm going to do that in real time because I was talking too much. <laughs> I lost you guys, I'm sorry. All right. 
and then siphon that water out of there as much as possible, sponge it out as much as possible. But then I put it right back in. So I drape my hands over. I've got one, my index finger draped on the outside, my middle finger and the rest of my fingers on the inside. And when I squeeze and drip the water, what it's doing is it's running down my finger on the inside and the outside. And the water is distributing from the top and the bottom all the way down to the bottom of my fingertip. All right, so underneath, push in and then pulling that clay up and then So a useful tool that I like when I'm making multiples and I want them to be uh, fairly close in size, it's called a tea bevel. And some potters might have a pottery version of this. I was working on, I didn't know what to specifically look for at the time. And so I purchased this tea bevel. I'm gonna grab my phone and show you this guy. And what this does is it allows me to set a height and I can throw multiple things. I'm going to move this guy. So it is a hardware store purchase. I've got a clamp holding it on. There's a couple pieces of wood because of the lip of the wheel. Move my water bucket. Oh, there we go. We're back. I need to plug in my phone, it looks like. And so it's uh, got a little wing nut here, and then this pivots. This moves back and forth. I can know there's a slot in here, so this allows me to move it back and forth. And so now this point, if I, if I like the height of this, I set that to that point, but I also slide it back so the point's not invading, and I can work on the diameter of my piece as well. All right. I am going to reposition something. And potters have fun stands at a any given chance, I got a ball of clay holding this guy up now. And I'll probably have clay in my micro or my speakers later. All right, so I'm gonna move this guy out of the way because I don't need it right now. I do need my water. I never even asked Sarah how long we wanted this to be. I'm just rambling. Go until you're done. People are awesome. still watching. Fantastic. Yep. All right. So when I throw my cups, I like to pull the clay to roughly around um, eight inches, seven and a half to eight inches on that pound and a half that I use. So I'm going to do a couple more pulls on this, get close to that height, and then we'll neck it in. And if you're ever unsure, measure, measure, measure. The motion that I'm doing with my hands currently is just collaring. I'm applying pressure uh, mostly in three points around the pot. So my heels, the heels of my palm, and then I'm applying pressure kind of with my index or my middle fingers on both of these. So there's kind of a triangular amount of pressure kind of happening. Um, I see a lot of people go this route. If your clay is thicker, you can get away with this. But typically what happens, and I'll, maybe I'll do it this way, is it just ovals it, and we just flatten and smash the pot. So having three points prevents us from just going completely oval, and then allows us to push back in multiple directions. My hands are completely grasping all the way around, but I'm really focusing on that pressure in specific areas.
All right. It's almost seven. We'll call that good. I'm going to bring it in just a little bit, though. Uh, a little more narrow. Um, I'm thinking of how this is going to feel in my hand. And I think this blue one that I have behind me is a really good representation of how I'd like them to turn out. So this one, let me turn it this way so you can't see uh, the dimple and messes it up. It's a little bit wider at the top shoulder than it is here. And I taper all of my cups so very subtly like that because I want my grip as the cup moves down, it starts to get larger and it prevents the, the piece from slipping out of my hand. Um, I, like I did earlier, I put this little dimple in and kind of see, turn it a few different ways. Um, and that's a little thumb spot. There's a little bit of a dimple on this side, but it's more so about my thumb feeling like I have grip there. And it feels really nice to make sure that that's, uh, I'm grabbing it properly. And I've got, it's about halfway up the piece. Um, so my thumb grabs and locks in and then that taper as it starts to move, if it starts to slide uh, or having too much sake, um, then I can catch and prevent the piece from falling, hopefully. I really want to know where I put that piece. Oh, well. So I'm just using my wooden knife to shave away a little bit of clay here. This is more than I typically like to have at the bottom of my piece. Um, and I found it, I told you I find it. This is a footing tool and it's, uh, you can find them from many pottery suppliers. One of my favorites is Dolan. And so this is a Dolan tool. There's a uh, left and right handed shapes and designs, steeper and less steep shapes. Now, the reason I like this is it works basically the same way that your wooden knife works. Uh, it's got that bevel in it, but this bevel tilts, it's the same angle almost exactly of this metal one. But um, the way that it grabs the clay on this sharp edge, it pulls it away really abruptly. And then I lightly, let's see if I can show this on here, kind of tilt it up as I'm doing this next step. And what it does is it gives a nice little glaze catch. Tilt this back a little, you can see this little ring down here. And that's typically all I ever need um, at the bottom of a piece to prevent my pieces from running too much. And I'll have it on, I mean, sometimes it's super subtle, uh, but I'll have it on my cups, everything I make. And um, it was my way to get fairly close to the bottom of a piece and not have to worry about wiping up the edge of it or the side of the piece, you know, like a quarter of an inch, just in case the glaze ran too much. So going to put this down, I cut underneath. And then it pulls that clay off of there. And then, as I said, I'll tilt that up toward the body of the piece. And it's just going to create a nice little flare at the bottom. And that's going to be where I wax my pieces to. I only wax some things. Um, I like to use a uh, wet sponge to, to get the uh, glaze off the bottom of most of my pieces. But specifically, when I put the the wiggle wire underneath, that means that there's gonna be underglaze on that surface. And so that's Amico Velvet underglazes. They don't flux in most situations. You do have to be careful using them on the bottom of pieces, some of the colors, uh, especially at higher temperatures. But what that does is if I didn't wax that, I apply my underglaze during the uh, disc stage. And if I don't apply wax, then when I go to wipe this off on the surface of my wet sponge, I wipe all of this color away. So everything else though, like this guy, um, I stain the entire cup up. I do all my coloring. I dip the entire thing without waxing. And then when I push on my sponge, it kind of goes up the side of the piece. And then I just kind of zhuzh it back and forth. 
and then it cuts it up to that kind of nice little dry line there. All right, so we're gonna collar this in now. So I've uh, gotten all the water out of the piece that I needed to. Um, once again, if I leave too much water in there, then it's going to create uh, S cracks, more commonly known. Um, so siphon all that water. If you have a sponge on a stick, uh, you can get to a specific point um, and kind of wet this, squeeze it into the opening, uh, but then you risk distorting the piece. So all the water's out. I'm gonna kind of lubricate the surface, get it nice and silky. And then I'm just gonna slowly start to overlap my middle fingers as I start to grab the clay. And then my thumb shortly will follow after. And I'm, the top of this is just gonna kind of melt in. Go a little bit faster with your wheel speed as soon as you're comfortable. You start to feel the clay kind of bunching up uh, and kind of getting bacon on you. And it's just gonna start to wave kind of in. Uh, you wanna stop and I use my fingertips and I apply pressure and throw the wall of that vertically a little bit more. If it's too thin, you wanna add a little bit of thickness at the very top when you start collaring. If it's too thin, then it's just gonna continually bake in and get really wavy on you. High pressure, even out and raise the wall. Um, I like my little okay signs. Uh, I'll do this is the same thing with collaring. I'll put pressure on my knuckles and then, so that's one and two, and then my fingertips, my middle fingertips behind. And so I kind of create more or four points of pressure. I'm slowly lifting up. I'm gonna reflare that out, but I still need to establish my shoulder. When you do collar, you are gonna start to thicken the clay. So you, I always go back in and throw the wall up a little bit. Establish that diameter of how big I want that opening to be. I still want to be able to fit some form of a brush in there if I need to clean when I need when I clean it. The truth came out. I don't clean my dishes. And then I'm going to figure out where this shoulder is actually going to sit. And the metal rib of death. And I'm just gonna hook my middle finger underneath the shoulder on the inside. And I'm gonna apply pressure on top and then on the side as well and establish where that shoulder is actually going to sit. I'm using the flat side. Um, I could use the round side, but that's gonna cause that kind of to dip in. And I also like the point here on the corner to dig in and create a nice little kind of a neckline. And I'll turn it over and we'll see how that looks. A little more curve into it. So when I push down on the clay and I'm establishing the angle of this shoulder, uh, what I'm doing, what's going to start to happen is the clay is going to flare out on the sides. And so I need to go back in with the flat side of my rib, apply a light amount of pressure on the inside, and straighten that up with a nice edge. I'm gonna use the curved part of this rib to put into the side here and really work the flare on the top. So I'm gonna start with my middle finger toward the bottom of the neck on the inside and slowly pull my finger up the side. And that's just to grab the shape that this rib makes, just like kind of when I was using, using it on the uh, my little glasses. So 
So I got a nice flare. It matches the shape of the cup. So there's a nice little curve in here, nice little curve in here. All right, and then like I said, I'm normally wait for this part, but I'm just gonna do it now. I'm gonna push in with my middle finger and my thumb on my left hand, my non-dominant hand. And I'm gonna use my middle finger, sometimes two fingers, depending on how wide this is. Uh, I'm gonna kind of pinch together, but then I'm gonna pull the clay into the crook of my fingers. And then create that Lin hole pouty lip. And then I like these, the tops of these to kind of start to curl in a little bit. I think it gives a sharper pour. And then there's the rim. Wire off. Um, and if you take this, I'll show some examples. If you take this and dance it around a little bit different every time you put it underneath your pot, it's gonna make a different design. Obviously, if you put it straight on and cut directly towards you, you've got this really simple straight line. Um, but this allows you to have multiple designs on the bottom of your pots. Uh, if you allow the wheel to spin as you're cutting, it'll create this nice little multiple line spiral on the bottom. Um, and then I guess this is something else I can tell you guys too. If you don't throw on bats, you work directly off the wheel head, um, ribbing the surface of the piece off and on larger pieces, if you can get rib on the inside and the outside, not a serrated rib, uh, and you can sandwich the clay between those ribs and you follow the body of the pot, what it does is it strengthens it. And when you go to grab the piece, it prevents it'll prevent it from actually deflating on you um and you're pulling all the slip off that is going to stick to your hands and cause more problems the pot itself might slip literally uh so we don't want that i need to put my thumb mark in here and so when i go to grab these pieces off i'm going to grab with my palms toward the base of the piece I'm gonna dry my hands really well. And then I'm applying pressure all the way around as much as possible and even, and I'm slowly tilting away from me toward me, lift directly up and let the clay stick to your hands rather than using strength to grab the piece. And actually, and that is that. There's the little wiggle wire design. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to talk about a few pieces and aesthetics. Um, I'll go grab a couple different wiggle wire designs. Um, and, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. You had fun. I had a good time. I didn't flop as many pots as I did this morning. Um, I'll show you three different designs that I've done with the wiggle wire. There's this zigzag pattern. A little wave. And this is if you have the wheel spinning while you cut. While, 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 however you say that word. Um, my tumblers and mugs, these are new. Uh, the image on the surface I was painting on and I, tend to feel that I need to constantly find ways to evolve my work. Sometimes it goes a little too fast, but hopefully for the better. Um, so I sculpted out in 
a what we call an oil clay and it's uh it def it's basically comprised of wax and dirt and oils and um i it never dries out so i can leave it out and i can keep that sculpture until i damage it but then i took a, a plaster mold off of the surface of that and i pour slip into uh black slip i tint some of my slip um gray slip and then the white slip and then i paint my colors to the surface so my yellow my red my blues my greens whatever else um and then i apply that to the surface of my cup while it's still in the a wet face, leather hard face. Uh, same way I do these little bolts and nuts on the surface. The handle's supposed to look like a, um, a hose holder, hose clamp. And so um, I was trying to find this compromise between aesthetics as well as comfort. And I hope that's it. I think that's it. A UFO. And once again, the bottom, trying to apply detail when somebody lifts it up and looks around at it, that they're going to be surprised when they when they see it. I'll go back to these trays once again. These are, are done in acrylic or just um, plexiglass, essentially. And I use bolts and nuts to hold them all together. And then because it scratches so easy, I've got little rubber dots on here to hold the decanter up off of the surface. And then these nice little decorative acorn nuts on the bottom to elevate the piece a little more. Uh, the aesthetic that I'm going with, the series that I, other than just the blatant space ships and uh, UFOs, is I wanted these to kind of have this um, kind of a, a tribal feel in the sense I, I'm a big sci-fi geek. And so watching things like um, Star Trek uh the klingon warships all have these really distinctive marks on them and so all of my pieces tend to have these colors that match and the design element will match with the harsh lines or the sharp points um or simple blocky shapes i haven't quite gotten into round forms yet um i put the colorado flag on every piece now. Um, I just purchased a uh, stamp for that. And then I've got three dots uh, and they're always done in primary colors. Before I started putting the Colorado flag on everything, uh, that was my way of signifying Colorado. Um, I'm also the third, so there's always three dots. Uh, it's also focusing on the simplicity of just the basics of color theory, uh, getting nerdy with just art in general. Uh, so yellow, red, and blue, um, and I'll have that in just different uh, orientation all over the piece. Um, but of course, then the colors of the Colorado flag are red, yellow, blue, and uh, white. Um, I think that's it. Are there any questions? I'll hold off for a second. Yeah, we can give people a second, but um, nothing else at the moment. Okay. Well, um, I'll check in on the video. Shoot me uh, a message if you want it. I'm on Instagram uh, at John R. Hamilton 3 Ceramics um, or Facebook, same tag. Uh, if you had any further questions, shoot me a comment, shoot me a question. Um, but I hope you guys had a good time. If you ever get the chance and you are in Colorado, come check out the Arvada Center. It's an amazing facility once again. Um, I'm happy to be a part of it. And I hope you guys had a great time.